Um, I want to welcome everyone here, including um, some of the kids I've seen in the audience. So welcome. We know you're um, as impacted as anyone. Um, I'm going to invite Brian Ward. Brian is an indigenous solidarity activist, and he's going to welcome us. Hi, hi again. My name is Brian Ward. Um, I'm an educator as well as I live in the most affected area. Um, just wanted, some of you may be familiar with what a land acknowledgement is, uh, but it's acknowledging that we're an occupied land um, and that this country is uh, founded on stolen land. So especially in this uh, context, it's important to understand that. So I'm just going to give an acknowledgement and what that looks like. Um, so we want to acknowledge that we are on occupied Ho-Chunk land. The Ho-Chunk Nation, uh, the people of the big voice, have called this place De Jop for time immemorial. This land was taken via treaty by the U.S. government in 1832, forcing the Ho-Chunk uh, north of the Wisconsin River, then in another treaty in 1837, forcing the Ho-Chunk out of their country to various reservations in Minnesota, then South Dakota, and then landing in Nebraska. Many Ho-Chunk resisted and others were forced west, made their way back to their country um, and are currently organized as the Ho-Chunk Nation of Wisconsin, whose government is based in Black River Falls, Wisconsin. The United States was founded on stolen land and the same military that we face off today against around the issue of the F-35s were instrumental in the brutal removal and struggle against hundreds of indigenous nations around the country. And to say that we should say we stand in solidarity with indigenous peoples on this land mass, they're still fighting for their rights for self-determination and liberation. Safe skies, clean water, Wisconsin. Schools keep it together to stop the F-35 jets from being based at Truax in Madison and to force cleanup of ground and water contamination originating from the base. The Midwest Environmental <laughs> Justice Organization was the first to alert people about a proposed based expansion at Truax. They have been studying contaminants coming from the base and the impacts on the surrounding neighborhoods, most with low income and minority populations. Thanks to the Midwest Environmental Justice Organization, concerns became public about PFAS, a class of toxic synthetic compounds linked to serious health problems. They travel readily through water and can migrate miles from the source. Firefighting foam used at Truax for decades in exercises by the Air National Guard, county, and city is the primary source of PFAS contamination in Madison waterways and wells. Quitting out an F-35 fire and training to put it out would require up to 10 times the amount of firefighting foam due to the composite materials that make up the jet's construction. In late 2019, the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources released a study showing that high concentrations of PFAS were found in Starkweather Creek near the air base and in fish found in both the creek and in Lake Monona. Local government committees are finally beginning to recognize and address the problem. Truax planned significant expansion of the base to prepare for the F-35 jets. This construction would unearth PFAS and other contaminants that have been leaching into the ground for decades. The military has declined to fund cleanup of existing PFAS contamination. Another reason for alarm, in 2018, the Department of Defense released its nuclear posture review, prominently naming the F-35 as a core part of its strategic nuclear force. The B-6112 nuclear bomb is designed especially for the F-35 and considered usable by government and military officials. This means that Madison could be an enemy target by housing delivery vehicles for nuclear weapons. This mission of the F-35 could increase the risk of a global nuclear war. The F-35 itself was proposed in 2001 and has been in production since 2011. It has been plagued with multiple setbacks, cost overruns, and safety issues. It is still a work in 
progress. The Air Force admits that F-35 fighter jets can be up to four times louder than the current F-16s. In addition, the number of flights would initially increase by 47% over current levels. Long-term exposure to these projected noise levels poses a number of health risks, especially to children and vulnerable adults. The Air Force released a draft environmental impact statement in August 2019, comparing five sites under consideration to host the jets and asked for public comments. The environmental impact statement states that there would be a disproportional impact to minorities, low-income residents, and children, and could cause hundreds of households to be incompatible with residential use. More than 2,200 people would be exposed to significantly higher noise levels. Northside Madison neighborhoods would be disruptive, causing harm to those who stay and creating a housing crisis for those who wish to leave one of the few affordable neighborhoods left in the city. Lockheed Martin and other defense contractors profit from the F-35 program. Taxpayers are projected to contribute more than $1.5 trillion over its lifetime, with 2,000 or more F-35 jets planned to be housed across the country. More jets mean a greater impact on climate change. The U.S. Department of Defense is the largest institutional consumer of fossil fuels in the world and a key contributor to climate change. The largest portion of Pentagon fuel consumption is for military jets. Early in 2019, Safe Skies Clean Water Wisconsin began to research the issues educate the community and mobilize citizens to voice their concerns to elected officials and the media. Many public officials changed their position after becoming aware of the negative impacts to their constituents. Hundreds of people turned out to comment in opposition to the F-35 proposal at the Alliant Energy Center. Hundreds more attended community meetings and spoke to the impact the F-35s would have on their lives. People testified in support of a resolution opposing the F-35s at a city council meeting. Individuals, environmental, and community groups submitted a record number of comments to the Air Force in response to the environmental impact statement. Everyone in the city of Madison, the state of Wisconsin, will bear the economic cost, disruption, and safety threats if the F-35s are based in Madison but the impact on climate change and global instability will have a far-reaching effect. The Air Force is expected to issue their final environmental impact statement in late February. They will announce their decision whether to base the F-35s in Madison 30 days after that. Until then, it is critical that we continue to voice strong public opposition in order to influence their decision. We demand no TRUAC's base expansion until existing PFAS and other contamination is cleaned up and we have guarantees that no more will be created. No increased noise levels, frequency of flights, or greenhouse gas emissions. No disruption or relocation of communities surrounding the base. No financial burden on residents of Madison or Dane County. No support or encouragement for any equipment or mission that might include the proliferation, transport, or use of nuclear weapons. No, no F-35s! F -35s. Good morning, information, visit our website at safecloudcleanwaterwi.org. Okay, now we're going to get into the um, panel. Um, we have a number of speakers that are going to get us um, up to date on all of the angles related to PFAS and TRUACS expansion and F-35s. And our first um, speaker is Maria Powell from the Midwest Environmental Justice Organization, the director. Um, she's going to talk about PFAS, soil and water contamination, and cleanup. Maria Powell, 
I'm the executive director of the Midwest Environmental Justice Organization, and thank you all for coming on this snowy day. Our organization has been working on PFAS for uh, about two years now, so I have a lot to say, and I'm hoping the moderator can cut me off at the appropriate time. <laughs> um, so what are PFAS and why are they a big problem? I'm going to go through this really broadly and generally, and some other people will follow up on it. PFAS stands for per and polyfluoroalkyl substances. There are about four to 6,000 plus different kinds of them, but in this case, we're mostly focused on uh, the PFAS that are used in firefighting foams at Truax and, and AFFF foams. They are known as forever chemicals because they don't break down in the environment. They also don't break down in our bodies and they build up in fish and in our bodies. And they're also very mobile in the environment so they can travel miles and miles. They're associated with a number, a growing number of very serious health problems. I will just give a laundry list and then Beth Neary will say more after me. Immune and thyroid dysfunction, developmental problems, high cholesterol, pregnancy complications, kidney and liver disease, various cancers, and more. And of course, as always, pregnant women and children are far more vulnerable than everyone else. Beth can take, a, take it from there. So at Truax, we have um, several really bad hotspots of, of PFAS. I, I don't know, I hope everyone can see those numbers. One of them has up to 46,000 uh, parts per trillion of a total of six PFAS. Now there's likely a lot more than that there. Is they haven't measured very many yet. These tests are very minimal. They're just shallow groundwater and shallow soils. They haven't done anything beyond a few tests, actually. So what does that mean? Uh, what do those numbers mean? Recently, the Wisconsin Department of Health Services proposed a 20 part per trillion standard for PFOA and PFOS. So you can see these are, levels are way above that. And then, so the other big issue here that I want to drive home is those tests were done in 2017, okay? They have done nothing since then. No further investigations, no cleanup, nothing. We have no idea how far the plume has gone. And the Department of Defense claims they do not have the money to do this. <laughs> I thought that would get a laugh. <laughs> um, okay, so as you, all, as you all know, if you've read the news at all, um, PFAS has now traveled down Starkweather Creek and into Lake Monona. That is not a surprise. PFAS are very mobile. Who knows how far they went at this point. And the levels in Starkweather Creek are quite high. Uh, even I was surprised when they finally did the measurements. Um, the, the, the worst, the highest levels were found just south of the base, just south of the, the, one of the burn pits in the base at 3,700 parts per trillion of PFOS and over 8,000 parts per trillion of total PFAS. Now what do those numbers mean? Well, we don't have standards yet in Wisconsin, which is unfortunate, but in Michigan, they're proposing surface water levels of 11 to 12 parts per trillion, and that's so that they don't build up in fish to harmful levels. In, I just heard of the European Union has a one part per trillion standard for surface water. So these, these are really, really super high levels. Um, and of course, they build up to even higher levels in fish. So you saw some of those numbers, 8,000 parts per trillion. In fish, we're finding levels of up to 180,000 parts per trillion. Um, that's a lot of PFAS. So they just recently issued advisories um, limiting fish consumption further. So environmental justice, that's what our organization works on. Who is most vulnerable to these exposures? Well, the low-income people of color living near the base, the Truex neighborhood, and the trailer park. Our organization works with the Truex neighborhood quite a bit. The middle picture there is our vice president, Chi Yen standing in the creek, actually. <laughs> um, this is before we knew about the PFAS contamination, and he grew up fishing in that creek, eating from that creek, eating fish from that creek, and feeding it to his family. And those exposures now cannot be undone, and, and that's really, really sad. So people who drank well, water from well 15, which everyone in the Truax neighborhood did, they also had that exposure, and a lot of other people drank that too. And then anyone who eats fish from Lake Monona, and there are a lot of people who fish down at the mouth of Lake Monona, if you know Ulrich Park, um, they're exposed to these chemicals as well. So planned construction at the base. Um, some of this is in preparation for the F-35, some of it isn't. It's very difficult to actually tell. Um, I'm not going to read through all those uh, lists of things there, the list of different projects they're going to do, but as mentioned in the intro video, 
Uh, the April 2019 environmental assessment that was very much slipped through, we happened to see it in the newspaper one day, and I rode my bike down to the library and got the document and went, oh my god, look at what they're doing here. It looks like they're preparing to do this. It, it slipped through without any public engagement, and unfortunately the city and county didn't have any comments on it, and it just, it was approved. And so, and then it, uh, recently, Somebody discovered that in the 2020 National Defense Authorization Act, they had already approved uh, $14 million for S-35 simulator facility and $20 million for, a fighter alert, for fighter alert shelters. And that construction is planned to start in April, okay? So two months from now. So why does it matter? All that construction will disrupt PFAS in the soils and groundwater at the base and release it into Starkweather Creek. Anytime you dig up to build things, it's going to release into the creek. And they have to do this thing called dewatering, which means sucking up the water and then releasing it mostly likely into back into the creek. And since it's really contaminated there, they haven't cleaned it up, it's just going to make the problem worse. So um, the other thing that was already mentioned, I'll just skim over this. If the F-35s are located here, they're, built out, they're made out of these very high-tech materials, nanocomposites, carbon nanotubes. They start burning. I've read reports done by the Air Force. They can burn for days, days, and, and, and they have to spray a lot of foam on it. So that's just also going to exacerbate PFAS problems. So I'm almost through with this, and I have to skim over this really fast, because who has the authority and responsibility to prevent more PFAS from getting into the creek and the base, and will they do so? Actually, a lot of different entities can do something. The Air National Guard, we are already know, um, should be doing things, but they're not. They're saying they don't have the money. The DNR has a lot of authority to enforce laws that we have on, on construction, on stormwater runoff. The, the county, which owns all the land, or not all of it, most of the land under the base, okay? They have a lot of power to do various things um, as far as, you know, enforcing laws, construction laws, stormwater laws, and, 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 and the city also has some authorities and responsibilities. Now, the, the Air National Guard, the county, and the city are all also responsible parties for some of the PFAS contamination at Truex Field, and that means broader than the base. But so that complicates matters because everyone's worried about their liabilities. So, as we said, Air National Guard says, DOD says there's no money. City and county are mostly saying they can't do anything and deferring to DNR. DNR is already moving forward with talking to the Air National Guard about these new construction projects. And um, meanwhile, I'm thinking, given that DNR has allowed toxic pollution from Truex Field to ooze into Sarkweather Creek for decades, should we really be assured by this? I'm, I'm not, actually. So, what can we do? Um, well, what we're doing here, educate, engage, organize, testify, demand that city, county, and state use their authorities and responsibilities to demand full PFAS investigation and cleanup at the base before any further construction goes forward. And for more information about some things we can do, feel free to contact me and I can hook you up with um, things we're doing to try to um, address these issues that I raised. Thank you. Thanks, Maria. Um, our next speaker is Dr. Beth Neary from the Wisconsin Environmental Health Network, who's going to speak on the health effects of noise in PFAS. Good afternoon. Um, I'm a pediatrician, so I care deeply about the health of children, especially. I practiced here in Madison for 15 years. I recently retired, and now I'm dedicating myself to advocating for environmental issues related to children. So the Air Force concluded in its draft report that locating the F-35s would have an extremely negative impact on children, people of color, and low-income individuals who live in dense populations in and around the airport. Approximately a dozen K-12 and 15 child care centers are in and around that area where the most intense noise would be predicted. So from my experience and research, I think that many of Madison's children will be harmed by the intense noise generated by these military jets that have no need for placement in a dense residential community. The early years of a child's life are critical for the development of hearing. And according to the Office of Disease Prevention at the National Institute of Health, Children's ears canals continue to develop during the early years of life. 
Loud noises during this stage of development can permanently damage their hearing. And the noise that's created by the F-35s is an impulse sort of sound, okay? Let me explain that to you. So impulse noise can really cause severe damage because it's different than what we call continuous loud noise. And the body actually has a reflex mechanism which protects the ear when exposed to loud continuous noise. The reflex is somewhat slow, and what it does is it dampens the actual um, eardrum so the sound doesn't get through. However, these sounds are so quick that this reflex doesn't work. And that's why this is more damaging to the ear. The health impacts of noise pollution include, even for adults, overproduction of stress hormones, interruption of sleep, ringing in the ear, negative effects on mental health, increased blood pressure, and impacts on cardiovascular disease. But for children, the impacts are far greater. The heightened noise interruptions can lead to delayed speech development, reduced attention, impaired concentration, long-term memory issues, and decreased math and reading scores. So the EIS includes a section on the impact of noise, citing studies that find a linear relationship between chronic aircraft noise exposure and impaired reading comprehension and recognition memory. Like I said, there's a dozen K-12 schools and 15 daycare centers in that area. And according to the City of Madison's 2018 Neighborhood Indicators Project, the kids who live in the Truex neighborhood are struggling even before they get to school, with only 48% of them considered to be kindergarten ready. One of the schools closest is Hawthorne Elementary, where most children are low income and of color. In a city that's struggling to overcome persistent racial disparities, flying an intensely noisy aircraft over their elementary school more frequently will only exacerbate these disparities. So if we truly care about children, we will act to protect them by opposing these. And let me speak for a few minutes about the PFAS issue. I recently testified before the state capitol as they were debating some bills, 772 and 773, um, last week, and this is what I said to them. PFAS is an emerging public health issue, toxic at extremely low levels, parts per trillion, we don't look at parts per trillion in any other chemical. They're highly persistent. They accumulate in humans, and they remain in the body for long periods of time. Let me give you some examples. PFOA, it's anywhere from two years to 10 years. PFOS, three years to 27. And PFHXS, that's the one in the firefighting foam, firefighting foam, 4.7 years to 35 years. There's no way to remove them from the human body. They're bound to proteins, and their very little is actually excreted. For me, as a pediatrician, I am so concerned about this for our children. And here's what really troubles me. PFAS is found in breast milk. It isn't just found in breast milk. It's concentrated in breast milk. If a mom drinks water that contains this amount of PFAS, the amount in her breast milk will actually be higher than what's in her water. That's a very troubling fact to me as a pediatrician. So when I look at what's on the website from the CDC, they say, what are the problems with PFAS? It interferes with the body's natural hormones, thyroid hormones, testicular, estrogen. It increases cholesterol levels, it affects the immune system, and increases the risk of some cancers. If you were at the Capitol the other day, you would have heard the people from Marinette, Wisconsin, whose water has been contaminated by the Tycho's plant up there, tell you of all their health problems. And honestly, it mimics the C8 study that was identified in the movie Dark Waters. And those facts are high cholesterol, ulcerative colitis, testicular cancer, kidney cancer, <laughs> preeclampsia, and elevated blood pressure during pregnancy. The C8 study also showed that participants had five times the amount of PFOA in their blood as compared with the rest of the population. So, um, to truly help uh, protect public health, we need to say no to the F-35s for many issues. The noise issues, ding ding, <laughs> as well as the PFOS issues. Thank you very much. Thanks, Beth. Um, our next
next speaker is Alder Rebecca Campbell, representing the uh, District 18 on the Madison Common Council, who um, this fall took a fact-finding um, trip to Burlington, Vermont, and has been an outspoken um, leader on the issue of um, pushing back against F-35. So um, thank you and welcome, Rebecca. Thanks. So we know F-35s are bad, and why? Do, how do we know that? A lot of it is from the Air Force's own information. So we learned in August when they released the draft EIS how bad these are for humans to be around. Um, and as we dug in a little bit deeper about these airplanes, we learned, or I, I learned that people are now learning, if you read the 2018 Nuclear Posture Review, that these are, these are nuclear weapons delivery systems that are at the forefront of the U.S. military strategy for, um, I think, what, I, I wrote down this word, um, like, what did they say? Dominant, uh, dominant combat air power around the globe. And that's what these planes are. These are not defense weapons. These are, not, these are atta nuclear attack weapons. So how do you spin that to people? How, you know, how do you spin that when your own data and information is saying these, the noise of this hurts people, um, and these are nuclear attack weapons? Well, you come up with myths. You come up with myths about the organization that is supposedly housing them. So supposedly the 115th Air National Guard, that, that's what these planes are for. But guess what? I found out they're not for the 115th Air National Guard. Okay, and so what we heard at the beginning from the Chamber of Commerce and the National Guard was, oh, we, you know, we, we protect the people and help in disaster relief, and if there's a fire at East, bomb at East Town Mall, we'll put the fire out, right? That's what the kind of things they were saying. Oh, these are community members getting, you know, getting their college education, and, and, and we need these jobs, and th th this is a positive force in the community. Well, actually, no, because when you look at that EIS, and you see the construction that's happening and where the jobs are going, the jobs, none of the jobs are going to the 115th fighter wing. 29 of the 64 jobs are going to Lockheed Martin contractors to run the simulator, and 35 of the jobs are going to the 378th fighter squadron, which is a, an active duty Air Force unit housed at Truax. Did you know that we have an active duty Air Force base there? Well, this whole project is for them. It's to, it's to get regular duty Air, Air Force pilots more flight time on these F-35 jets. So the Air Force's uh, strategy is to sprinkle these jets all around the country so pilots can get fight, uh, flying time. Why can't they get flying time at regular Air Force bases like they can with other uh, equipment? Because these planes break down all the time. They're only flying one out of three days. They're so poorly uh, constructed and hastily put into use that pilots can only fly them one out of every three days. So about, you know, I'm not going to talk about this associate uh, active duty thing. But there's so many myths, and the, the big myth about jobs and that this is for the Air National Guard, it's not. They're not. They're not. Another myth um, is that, oh, the, the, um, the Air National Guard is a good neighbor. Well, tell that to the people who have been sexually harassed and assaulted and had their, uh, had their cases poorly investigated, and now, you know, the, the, the National Guard is under federal investigation for that. Um, but also, yes, we'll, we'll, um, the noise can be mitigated. We can mitigate the noise. Well, what they say in the EIS is the Air Force has no resources for any kind of mitigation. Air Force itself will not mitigate any noise. As if you could mitigate the outdoors, which you can't. Um, so this fact-finding trip that uh, Chris Taylor and Dylan Brogan and Brandy Grayson and Amelia Rocco Moore and I took in October to Burlington, we went there because the FAA was having a meeting with the people at their um, airport because they were get, they actually have F-35s. Um, and we wanted to see, well, what is this mitigation? And what we learned was it's basically what it did to the nearby neighborhoods, 
in Burlington because they had experience prior uh, Part 150 mitigation programs destroyed neighborhoods, pitted neighbor against neighbor um, in, in some really awful ways and, and completely destroyed neighborhoods. So um, when we came back from that, we decided we needed to meet with our airport director and FAA people from uh, the Midwest region. And, and we had that meeting, a number of us alders and county board supervisors. And what we learned there was basically if I'm just going to say the last part, and then I'll uh, segue into, into Jesse, was that the process by which this FAA noise mitigation money for either soundproofing or for um, providing a, either buying your house, sound, soundproofing, or providing um, an extra boost of money if you can't sell your house um, at you know, a value that would be equitable for that same kind of house somewhere else, um, your own, that, that project takes so long to even begin studying that kids will be like seven years old enduring the worst impacts of this noise before any little bit of money is even released because um, they can't even begin to study this until all of the F-16s are gone and there's an undetermined period of time where the F-16s and F-35s are going to be flying at the same time. And that's the 7,000 something sorties uh, a year. So that's the worst impacts, no mitigation for that. Then once the F-16s are gone, then they can start a year long study. And then after they do a year long study, then it'll take two to three years to get their application in to the FAA to apply for money to provide homeowners for soundproofing money, et cetera, et cetera. Then, in addition, Wisconsin is this block grant state, so there's an added level where we have to go through the state DOT and the Bureau of Aeronautics to compete for funds for this program. So, if when you hear about, you know, your home can be mitigated, it's a total myth, and um, it, in effect, it's a myth, and um, Jesse's gonna talk about these legal documents that um, the airport has signed with many of the nearby homes um, that are going to make it even harder. Thanks, Rebecca. Um, Jesse Pekaholz from Solidarity Realty is going to talk to us about navigation easements, local economic impact, and property values. Um, and I was grateful to hear from uh, Jesse. Um, a few months ago when the City County Homeless Issues Committee took on this issue and um, heard from a number of panelists. And that's something that um, I take really seriously because I'm a housing lawyer and um, I know and have represented a number of people that live in low-income areas um, around Truax. And I know that in this, in this city and in this county, we do not have meaningful housing choice. People do not have many housing options. And when we have a proposal like this that will disproportionately impact people that already have a really tough time um, looking for housing and, and accessing housing, and we're going to further destabilize folks who are already struggling to make ends meet, I, I think it's un really unconscionable. And I think. Um, you know, that's why the City County Homeless Issues Committee spoke out um, strongly and I believe unanimously um, against the F-35 sighting and communicated that to Senator Baldwin and the congressional delegation. So anyway, um, I'm glad that you'll get a chance now to hear from Jesse about the impact on home values um, and residents in the area. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Seems every time we have one of these, it snows heavily. We should have them more often. <laughs> easements and property values. So, as Alder Kemble mentioned, there's these easements that exist. This, most of these were sold uh, before uh, Dane County Regional Airport was expanded in the 90s. So, as you know, an easement is an agreement between two parties for some shared use of property, mostly we think of as driveways, right? And the avigation easement, which, by the way, I did not know avigation was even a word. I just kept thinking, oh, it was a typo. Uh, that is when a property owner has one of these easements, but it's about the sound quality, the, the sound space about, above and around their home. 
And most of these were sold in the 90s uh, for about $2,000 a piece. And that precludes, you know, the homeowner from making any claim or at least the, the reason for it. And, and there's a whole, I am not a lawyer, so there's a, there, there's a whole host of legal arguments to be made back and forth. But from what I understand talking uh, with Heidi before this event is that uh, it is the opinion of Dane County Regional Airport's lawyer that this precludes a homeowner who has one of these from making any kind of claim for uh, monetary compensation these uh, alleged soundproofing programs that don't yet exist, um, regardless of any future changes to uh, the sound space about your home, types of aircraft changing, the number of flights, and uh, use of afterburners. And we'll talk about that a little more in a moment. Here on the left is the uh, sound map that was in the EIS. You'll see there's a color gradient that gets louder and louder as you get closer and closer to the runway. The takeaway here is that outer line is what they're calling a uh, 65 DNL, right? So that's inside of that they're saying this is uh, what would cause or what would trigger a, a homeowner to start to apply to any benefits that might be um, afforded at some point in the future, maybe. Now our firm has done some research for homes in and around that 65 decibel zone uh, to see where these easements exist and where we found them is actually right here, oh, you can't see it, right to the south, with that southern tip of, uh, of that um, sound contour juts out. And you can see these are all the little homes on the right-hand side in green that have these easements. People who probably need the most protection from this uh, dangerously high level of noise. So these easements are meant to preclude a homeowner from making a monetary claim. And we found over 400 abrogation easements in total. And that is, and this is a very, uh, all, all the estimates that we use in any kind of our methodology are meant to be very conservative so that uh, they're unassailable. They're usually, uh, in reality, probably much higher. But this is at least $100 million of residential property that uh, holds these easements. Now, 65 DNL, well, the, the, the words that you hear a lot, incompatible for residential use, that's a designation, uh, that's a verbiage used by the U.S. Air Force. So that's not something that we're just throwing out there. Um, this de this uh, level is threshold is commonly used metric to decide what homeowners would have a, a potential long-term hearing loss risk. And uh, to help determine, you know, when there are these kind of block grants depending state by state, uh, what the situation uh, looks like to distribute any potential federal money, um, who would get it, maybe. It does not mean uninhabitable. It doesn't mean that the city would say you can't go back into your home, um, whether that's good or bad. Uh, it, it just means that there's this higher recognized elevated uh, risk. And just because it's 65 DNL, that doesn't mean, you know, we, we think of decibels, uh, um, in it, you know, what's the highest level usage? This is a day-night average between the highest event and the dead of night. So in this zone, you'll still commonly experience sounds well above 100 decibels. So that's the DNL, is that average. SEL, single event level, that's what we think of when we think decibels. That's when you turn on you know, your vacuum cleaner and it's getting to uh, 80, 85 decibels or so, or somebody's shouting at 100 or 110, right? And just to give you some clue, because I know this is very opaque, and I'm not going to get deep into the science behind decibels, uh, you know, we think, gosh, 50 decibels, 100 decibels must be twice as high, and it's, that's not the case. It's a logarithmic scale. So um, 53 decibels is actually double the, the sound of 50 decibels. Every 10 decibels of increase is about three to four times uh, louder than the previous 10. So for example, a loud motorcycle might be around 95. This is off the CDC's website, by the way. Uh, and you can see hearing loss. That's, that's not saying that that's going to be blood-curdling ear pain, because a lot of hearing loss is very slow and subtle and not noticed until you're exposed to this kind of stuff for years. I don't know how many of you have worked in a um, concert venue for many years, but you'll, you'll realize that maybe you should have been wearing those earplugs like your managers told you. <laughs> uh, 
Yeah, so a, a loud concert venue might be 110 uh, decibels, or standing next to, to sirens from a fire truck that drives by can be uh, 120 decibels. These are the kind of peak levels that we're anticipating, and unfortunately, were not included in uh, the EIS report that was sent out to the public from the Air Force. Um, so this can be from a residential, uh, from a real estate perspective, this, uh, this kind of notice given to us by a government agency is what we would construe as a defect. And it's something that even if you don't know as a, a homeowner when you're trying to sell your home, it is something that a licensee that helps you sell that, or if you're trying to sell on your own, that the buyer's agent should be picking up on because they're reasonably expected to know these things about real estate in that area. So here's again that proposed sound map. This again is the DNL. Now what this does not, and nowhere in the report does it show, is that SEL level, which is uh, a little bit more um, concerning when we're trying to think about who gets hearing loss and when. So we looked, uh, our firm, Solidarity, looked at the, the uh, EIS that was put out in the fall, late summer fall, and we said, okay, missing from this conversation, how much real estate are we even talking about here that's inside that line? So we totaled it up. We poured over all the uh, 2019 tax assessments, and uh, I want to stress that's not market value, right? When we think about property value, I think about three legs of a stool, right? There is market value, which is what anyone is willing to pay for a home, and then there's tax assessment, which is different, and then there's the bank appraisal. Now these three values are usually moored together somewhat, loosely tethered, uh, but they're not identical. And in Dane County, the tax assessment is usually less than the market value. So again, a conservative estimate. And we came up with $255 million of residential real estate that is gonna have this designation of, as incompatible for residential use. Uh, the EIS, uh, suggest that there's 1,300 households that will experience this designation, and when we went over the tax records, we were able to identify 819 actual residences, so there's potentially many more out there. And uh, to wrap up, you know, when we're comparing, what are going to be the, you know, all policy has winners and losers, and uh, any time that if any of you have reached out to Senator Baldwin's office uh, to ask her why she's supporting this, and what we've heard back time and time again is that there is a hundred million dollars in a UW study of economic activity due to Truex Field. And I just want to quickly dispel a couple of myths about that uh, because they keep calling it a UW study to kind of lend the imprimatur of UW Madison. When this is a UW extension, and not to poo poo the folks who study at the UW extension, but uh, it's not the same thing as UW Madison. We should just make that distinction clear. And this study was funded by Scott Walker's WEDIC, which was re the replacement for the, cha of the um, Department of Commerce, right? Uh, so just so we know kind of where these numbers are coming from, and Senator Baldwin's office claims support based almost exclusively on this figure. So it's important to kind of suss these numbers out. Uh, that $100 million, if you read the study, it's about 30 pages long, maybe a paragraph per page. It's not too dense and it's not hard to get through. Uh, that's for all federal dollars being sent back to Wisconsin via Truex. So that is airmen's salaries. That's also contractors on base. There are several branches uh, on the base that operate, not just the Air National Guard. Uh, there's the Army National Guard, as we just heard earlier. The U.S. Air Force is actually operating out of there, right? So that is uh, all the bases. I also want to stress that um, what's being insinuated here is that if we don't get these F-35s, that nice shiny $100 million will go away. And that's not the case at all. So we need to be really clear about that. Uh, in order to close or relocate a military base, it has to go through a process called BRAC, it's the base uh, relocation and closure. It's a typically multi-year process that involves coordination between the Pentagon and Congress, which you can imagine is slightly bureaucratic. Uh, and uh, nowhere in that report does it say that $100 million stays local. So when they're you know, buying light bulbs, they're not getting that from the local hardware store. When they're getting food for the mess hall, that's not coming from a Dane County farmer's market. And as last I was aware, we don't make replacement jet parts. Uh, anywhere in Wisconsin. So there, there's no actual verification that any of that money is uh, destined and, and guaranteed to stay here in Dane County. 
Uh, also, that is not uh, the net impact, it's the gross number of federal dollars coming in. And the report itself does say uh, that that does not cover the opportunity cost. What would we do uh, if we were to get uh, that money to do some other social program that would create some economic benefit? You know, what would happen if Truex were to close entirely and we turned it into uh, a, another college or um, an expansion of, of Madison College, something like that. Um, we, that is a, a, a gross number, not a net number. With that, I will uh, turn it back over to Heidi. Thanks, Jesse. We're about um, into our second half of the program. We're going to take a quick break to hear a little appeal from Alan, and Vicki is going to give us um, a little bit of a uh, um, information about next steps and how to get involved. Look, we're building a movement here. That means the participation of everyone in this office, oh, office yeah, this auditorium, and everyone you all know. Many of us remember the old slogan about we wish for the, that the day will come along when all the social needs that we all have, that we all understand, that are absolutely fundamental to a health, healthy and vibrant society would be funded and that the Air Force and the military would have to have a bake sale, right? Well, we know about what happened just now with the Chamber of Commerce removing its order for baked goods from Just Bakery because Madison Urban Ministry has spoken out against the F-35s. Well, we, we don't want to have to have bake sales to build our movement, right? So we're going to pass buckets, right? Put in what you can, and I'll sit down and be quiet. Thank you very much. <laughs> Also, just to let you know, we have buttons and bumper stickers and yard signs, which you can stick in your snowdrifts now. And, you know, whether you've donated or not, please take whatever you can use and whatever you can give away because we want our city to be plastered with no F-35 signs. If you write a check later, where do you send it? Um, you could write a check to Wisconsin Network for Peace, Justice, and Sustainability, WNPJS, and that would be tax deductible. If you go to our website, there's a page called Donate, and you can just get that information there. So I just want to talk about, I mean, we've gotten all this bad news, right? Um, but the good news is that we have power. Um, we have learned. We do, we do. And our, power comes, our power comes from our voices. We've learned from the people in Burlington, Vermont, that the Air Force actually declined initially to put the F-35s there, and it was only through the backdoor um, manipulations of Senator Patrick Leahy that that decision got reversed. So, um, you know, they had to find all this out using a Freedom of Information Act request and, and going through all kinds of, of communications. So what we know from them, and they've been incredibly helpful to us, um, in fact, yeah, um, is that the Air Force is paying attention. They're paying attention to the, the media, they're paying attention to the public um, comments, they're paying attention to lots of stuff. And if, if they see that they are not wanted here, that there's a possibility maybe of lawsuits and lots of protests, they may, not, they may decide not to put the jets here. And, and they have actually said that. So we need to... And you, you know, you're going to hear in the media that it's a done deal, we're getting the F-35s, so there's nothing we can do. Well, that's just not true at all. It's not a done deal. There are five sites under consideration, um, and we just need to continue the momentum, keep the momentum up, um, keep it in the public eye, and we have a number of ways you can do that. We have a petition. If you haven't signed it yet, there were earlier petitions for various things, but we're trying to compile them all into one. So we started one this year, and, and if you want to learn some new technology that you may not be familiar with, 
On the inside of your program is a QR code. It's like a little square barcode thing. If you've never used one of those, and if you have a smartphone, it's totally cool because you can aim your, you can focus your smartphone on the QR code, and it will pop up the website that takes you to the petition. So you can do that, or you can go home, go to the website, click the link, and sign up there. Um, so. The other thing you can do is when you came in with your program, you got these little voided checks to Tammy Baldwin for, let's say, no F-35s on them. Um, people have been contacting Tammy Baldwin's office by phone, by email, by letters. Um, we think this will help get her attention more, and we've start, been doing this for a while. Um, write your message on the back um, of that voided check and tell her why you don't want the F-35s to come to Madison. Make sure you have your name and at least your zip code on the front. Address is helpful so she knows you're a constituent. And um, you can drop those in the box on the way out and we will deliver them. She's also having, and the, oh, the recent Tammy Baldwin, of course, when we heard about Senator Leahy, um, we know that senators do have power. And well, Tammy Baldwin is not Senator Leahy, but she's still, can be influential and she needs to know the level of opposition that we have here in Madison. There are some events coming up. Um, well, Senator Baldwin's having a birthday party fundraiser next Saturday. And if you want to join the protests outside Cargo Coffee East, you can do that. Um, there is a this coming Wednesday. Well, you can look at the upcoming events in here, but I really want to stress that we have um, designated Leap Day, February 29th, as a parade to the gates of Truax. And we really want to show our strength. So if you put that on your calendar and tell everybody you know, it should be a really interesting, creative event. We have all kinds of interesting ideas for it. Um, and if you have ideas and you would like to contribute them, there's a, one, of your, one of the cards we gave you you can put your name and contact information and any ideas you have or skills you have or ways you'd like to help with, with that or with anything else that we do. And let's see. Well, just to say, our Facebook page has more than 1,000 followers. We have a website that's had over 5,000 page views. Um, people have been really active. And we have turned the basing of the F-35s from a little notice story to front page news and lead stories on television news. And that is that. There was some talk about the Madison Chamber of Commerce. It turns out that not all of the people on the board were aware of the decision to not buy from Just Bakery and might not have been in agreement with that, so we're not really sure whose decision that was. We also know that there's a lot of members of the Greater Madison Chamber of Commerce that aren't aware of this kind of advocacy that the Chamber of Commerce does, so if you know anybody or visit any local businesses who are members of the Chamber of Commerce, let them know that they can pressure the Chamber to focus on local economic development not just, um, not the defense contracts. Yay. Yay. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay, our next panelist is um, former District 12 Alder and past president of Madison Equal Opportunities Commission, um, Brian Benford, the amazing, inspiring Brian Benford. Hello, everybody. First of all, I'd like to thank Safe Skies Clean Water Coalition for bringing us all together. And it's great to see so many familiar faces out in the crowd. I just want to, before I start, I want to share a couple quotes to kind of frame what I want to talk about. Every gun that is made, every warship launched, every rocket fired signifies, in a final sense, a depth from those who hunger and are not fed, those who are cold and are not clothed. This world in arms is not spending money alone. 
It is spending the sweat of its laborers, the genius of its scientists, the hopes of its children. The cost of one modern heavy bomber is this, a modern brick schoolhouse in more than 30 cities. It is two electric power plants, each serving a town of 60,000 population. It is two fine, fully equipped hospitals. It is some 50 miles of concrete pavement. We pay for a single fighter with half a million bushels of wheat. We pay for a single destroyer with new homes that could have housed more than 8,000 people. This is not a way of life at all. In any true sense, under the cloud of threatening war, it is humanity hanging from an iron cross. Some of you know who said that, right? Raise your hand. A few of you. I was born in 1959, and President Eisenhower said that on his way out of office. So in the few minutes that I have, I want to talk a little bit about the military-industrial complex. I kind of coined it differently. I call it the military-industrial-congressional complex. Because nothing happens in a vacuum absent of our national political leaders. So I'm really empowered that folks are uh, pushing back on uh, Senator Baldwin and uh, Congressman Polkan on this. So it's been in the papers, it's been bantered about for years. I came to Madison in 1979 and I heard about these horrendous racial disparity gaps. Let me just share a few facts. There's folks that probably already know this, and once again, it's been in the papers as of late. So here's some old numbers, but in 2011, the medium household income of Dane County's African-American families was $20,664. Less than one-third the medium income enjoyed by white families of 63,673. In 2011, 54% of African Americans live below the poverty line compared to 8.7% of white families. Three quarters of African American youth are poor compared to 5.5% of the white population. Once again, these are old numbers, but I think they're still on trend. 25.2% of African Americans are jobless compared to 4.8% of white people here in Dane County. In 2011, nearly half of Dane County's black third graders failed to meet proficiency standards in reading, compared to 10.9% of white third graders. Now I know these statistics get boring and numbers kind of go over your head. I share this because I'm a father of five. I had four kids that graduated from this very school, and I have a beautiful seven-year-old sitting in the front seat and I look forward to the day that he walks across the stage, too. So much has to be done in regards to racial disparities. So much. When we try to triage our societal problems, there's just so much. So when I think about an F-35 currently costs between, oh, 94 million and up to $112 million, there's a little bit of money there, right? As we think about a referendum coming up just to keep our schools open. So when I think about racial disparities and I think about where we are as a community, I believe that stopping the F-35s here now can really be empowering to us really taking a deeper dive into some of the other racial disparities. I really believe that this is a golden opportunity that we can come together and stop this insanity, these insidious war machines that here in this progressive community that we come to love, that we can say no, that we're not taking it anymore. Thank you, thank you. I think that would empower other people to once again take a deeper dive and feel encouraged that we can do more as a community. So in closing, I want to thank everybody again for putting on this forum. 
Uh, they say it's cathartic to have your voice heard when you're angry. I'm really angry about this. I, I live across the street, and every time these jets go over, I think about where we are as a society and how much more that we can do. So thanks again for your time. I appreciate it. Um, now we're going to hear um, on video from Pierre Sprague, the defense analyst, um, from his January 17th talk here. The F-35, despite everything you've heard from its defenders, is substantially more noisy, substantially worse, more harmful to people's health, to children's development, people's sleep and so on, it's really loud. The second thing is a, a safety problem that you may not know about. <clears throat> Let me start by saying that two-thirds of all airplane crashes are within five miles of the runway because takeoff and landings are more dangerous than any other part of the flight. When an aluminum airplane crashes in a city, and we've had that happen, it's bad because the fuel burns, the aluminum doesn't burn, the fuel burns, and you burn down a few houses. We just had an incident a few years ago in Norfolk like that. Fortunately, nobody got hurt, but several houses got burned down. When an F-35 crashes, it's not an aluminum airplane. It's in the trade we call it a plastic airplane. It's composite materials, which are fibers, carbon fibers, and a very advanced form of epoxy. And the plane structure burns in addition to the fuel. And when that plastic burns, it's incredibly toxic. It is corrosive to lungs. It lets out all kinds of carcinogens and so on. When you add to that the stealth, remember this is not just a plastic airplane like some of the newest airliners. This is also a stealthy airplane. The stealth makes it an order of magnitude worse. I cannot tell you the number of cases <coughs> of people poisoned by stealth chemicals, even when they haven't been burned, like production workers have had terrific problems from breathing the fumes of stealth coatings. Uh, and when it burns, of course, the results are far worse. The Air Force has a commitment to make every single seat fighter they've ever had since the early 50s to make it nuclear capable. And the reason they're telling you that, oh, your, your F-35s won't, won't carry nuclear weapons is because of the horrible mismanagement of the whole F-35 program. 14 years after it started, they're still busy designing this airplane and testing it and changing it. And no F-35, neither the ones in Madison nor the ones the Air Force owns, has any nuclear capability now because they haven't finished designing and testing it. They're right in the midst of it. It'll be, it'll be finished fairly soon. I guarantee you, when they're finished with that, within 10 years, the Madison F-35s will have nuclear wiring because this is something, again, driven by money, driven by that horrible budget process that Mark Twain kind of presaged weapons stored here. That's not the issue at all. The issue is that if you have an F-35 squadron here, it can be activated at any time by the president. Uh, and since we now have this tradition that every time there's a little trouble in the world, we deploy, we deploy bomb, bombing airplanes to the trouble spot at least in order to threaten people, if not to actually bomb them. You know, this, is, this is the single most dangerous destabilizing aspect of nuclear weaponry there is, is the single seat fighter with the single pilot in control. There's no other place in nuclear weaponry where you don't have a crew to stop something from happening if somebody goes rogue. Think about that. Now, why are small, precise nuclear weapons dangerous? because they have revived an old and totally discredited concept that you can have 
little controlled regional nuclear wars. You just drop a nuke precisely here, make sure it's not too big, you drop one there, and the enemy is all impressed and he gives up. This is the concept of now called flexible response. That's even worse than the reigning concept of the nuclear holocaust balanced by terror on both sides. Because again, this is inviting some future unstable president to make a little demonstration with a little small nuke. Trump commissioned a new nuclear policy review in 2018. Those are very important documents that are put out every four years. In truth, they're documents to justify spending more on nuclear weapons, but they're taken by the world as a statement of American strategy with nuclear weapons. And this one states for the first time ever, it mentions a fighter as part of America's strategic forces. And it mentions the F-35 eight times by name. That's never been done in any previous nuclear posture review. You can imagine how seriously the Russians and the Chinese nuclear strategists take this. I'm sure they read it more carefully than we do. Once that strategic posture review says the F-35 is an integral part of America's strategic nuclear deterrent, that makes Madison a target. So when people attack you for opposing the F-35 here, as they attack me, of course, uh, as unpatriotic, I think it's very easy to answer. No, the real patriotism is to oppose an airplane that is this disastrously ineffective, dangerous, and unsuitable. That's true patriotism. There will be a big increase in PFAs with the F-35 for reason to do with these fires that you can't put out. It turns out when you want to put out, you know, the, the largest source of PFAs in general around bases is firefighting foam, uh, which of course ruins groundwater and so on. Uh, to put out an F-35 fire as opposed to an aluminum airplane fire takes at least 10 times as many gallons of firefighting foam because the, the fire is so persistent and, and creeps between the layers of the, of the uh, carbon fiber cloth. So you will have a big increase in PFAs at least being stored here, and presumably when firemen train, they'll be squirting F-35 anti-fire foam with lots of PFAs, and it'll be, they'll need about 10 times as much as they're using now, and they're ready, you know, as you all know, I'm sure, there's already a big PFA problem around here. So if you're interested in the, the whole presentation, which um, his basic speech was about 20 minutes, um, it's on our website under videos, and there's also an audio interview that um, from the, the public affairs show that lasts an hour that has even more in it. So, um, you know, he's a really good speaker, really interesting, knows a lot of stuff. Thanks. Okay, our um, last presenter is, before we get into the Q&A, and I know we got started a little late, so we'll be able to um, stick around a little bit longer to make sure we get um, some questions answered, but our um, last presenter is Alan Ruff, um, host of WRTFM's A Public Affair, um, and a historian, and he's going to speak on the myth of defense and the permanent war economy. Welcome, Alan. When I first got, began to get involved in this opposition to the F-35s, I was hearing from people, well, what's the big deal with noise and pollution and so on? It's just people up on the north side, the northeast side. Well, I live downtown. And I realized that that was a, becoming a kind of dismissive, well, that's just NIMBY crap, right? Not, not in my backyard. Well. We live in a huge backyard. It's called the globe. I want to 
to talk for a few minutes about the permanent war economy. That is the root of all the problems and issues that have been discussed by this panel today. It's the perpetual system of war, the preparation that, that preparation that siphons off five, excuse me, point five four percent, over half the percent of total of every discretionary federal tax dollar goes to the military. Right. To what you know, Brian Benford referred to as to what Dwight Eisenhower's speech, that military industrial complex that is more accurately today understood as the military industrial congressional university complex. It's a giant system devouring resources are, uh, from our national well-being and, and the patrimony uh, uh, that, that we pass to our next generations. It is annually segments off billions from domestic needs in the name of what? You hear from the pro proponents here every day. In the name of defense and security. This crazy phrase, oh, the, that noise we hear flying overhead is the sound of freedom. B.S. That jet-propelled system of, of insane spending and profit uh, is step, stemming from the realization made long ago, comes from that realization made long ago, as far back if, uh, as the Civil War, if not earlier, that war and the preparation for war is immensely profitable. Part of Pierre Spray's talk that he gave, he says, this has nothing to do with security or defense or even weapons. It has to do with spending and making money, taking money from all of us in the room. Very quick numbers. Approximately 55 Point five billion dollars went into research and development for this plane. Right. The real cost of the F-35 uh, is it will be above 100 million per plane for the fiscal year 2020. Each plane, now dig on this, they tell us we should be efficient with our fuel economy, right? Each plane cost an estimated $44,000 an hour to fly. Okay. A single pilot's helmet, parenthetically and incidentally, created by a joint venture between uh, Lockheed Martin and, and an Israeli electronics firm, each pilot's helmet cost $400,000. The annual operating cost of each, each of these planes is now projected at, uh, each of these projected 64,000 planes will be $5 million each. That's just operating cost. In total, we're talking about $1.5 trillion through the life of this plane. We're looking at hidden costs, immense budget overrides, costly delays, wasteful inefficiencies. Right now, and this gets to the heart of the congressional support for these planes, Lockheed Martin subcontracts to 1,600 firms in 250 congressional districts in 48 states, plus contributions from the coffers of of eight or nine now international partners that are drawing from their people to pay to buy these airplanes. The F-35, some F-35s are already in use. As early as November of 2018, Israel used them to attack uh, places in Syria and more recently in Iraq. From 1789 until 1947, the nation had what was called then a war department. It 
was renamed the Defense Department in 1949. <clears throat> at the height of the Cold War. After all, we're the good guys, we're the bad guys, and we only defend things. We don't, we're, we're not offensive. We're not war makers. How else could the Pentagon planners, the White House national insecurity planners and strategists, the war profiteers and the congressional allies publicly justify the nuclear arms race, the ever-increasing appropriations for new, ever-more costly weapons systems? The F-35, while being sold to the public in the name of defense, is an offensive weapon, as has been said here before. It is, the, in essence, the tip of the excuse me, the tip of the spear, an attack weapon that will be utilized when deemed necessary uh, or fit by the unfit. Now the question is, can these planes be stopped? Can the Air Force be made to, be, to back off the basing of planes here? That depends, of course, on the strength of the opposition, our strength. It's time for the people of Madison to send a message, to reclaim our history as a progressive center of opposition to war and militarism. This area became an international node of opposition on numerous occasions, dating back not just to Vietnam, but to the days of fighting Bob Follett when he got up in, in the Senate and said, this is boondoggle, this is waste, this is war profiteering and it must not go on. And he said that in opposition to the U.S. entry into World War I. We have to say, we, we, everyone in this room and everyone we know, as I said before, we must send a message that these murderous war machines, these attack jets, will do nothing to actually provide real defense and security and certainly not well-being. That, that in actuality, we must assure the, that the worsening of living conditions must not take place, especially for those already relegated to the lower rungs of the all too often racialized economic ladder. I'm urging people to turn out and to bring everyone you know to turn out on February 29th as we go on a parade to the gates of Truax because our massive, dis our massive visibility there is key. Otherwise we're dismissed, we're written off as just a, a few radicals or discontents or local NIMBY folks, we all have to get mobilized, motivated, and please join in however and wherever you can and spread the word about why we must oppose this monster. Okay, so now we're gonna get into the Q&A period. Um, there are some people with mics. <laughs> Um, they'll be uh, walking through the crowd. Um, also, if we don't get to answer your question, please write them down and we will collect them and get back to you and make sure that you've signed up for our list. Um, I also just want to take a quick moment um, to thank you for coming. It's great to see so many neighbors and community leaders here. Um, I see um, Alder Marsha Rummel, and I know Alder Patrick Hack was here. There he is. Um, who both have been, um, you know, really involved in these issues of PFAS and F-35s. And um, State Representative Chris Taylor was here too. And um, she has been a tremendous leader working so hard on this issue. And really, in a lot of ways, out there alone, speaking out is one of the um, st state officials um, opposing this. So, really appreciative of that. Um, all right, do we have any questions from the audience? Hi, thanks everybody. I just have a couple of questions on the numbers um, in that list. Alan, you said that there's 64,000. Um, well, it, it says, like online, maybe it's right, but it's like 40, 440, it says. And 
you could be right or my phone could be right. <laughs> but the other thing also is that the, the military budget is over half of the discretionary funding, not over 0.5%. So those are a couple. Okay. Okay. Over here, I got. Yes, um, first of all, I'd like to make a comment regarding this oft-quoted uh, um, speech by Eisenhower that he made roughly three days before leaving office about the military-industrial complex and what the military budget takes things away from. I mean, it's accurate, but it's also very time-worn. And what's overlooked is the fact that when Eisenhower said this, it was roughly two weeks after he had broken off diplomatic relations with Cuba, a misstep that wasn't rectified until the Obama years. And um, I think it demonstrates just what, uh, or how brave politicians become when they're just about to leave office or have left office. And I think that type of remark we have to take with many grains of salt. And it was also, he made it roughly three months before the failed Bay of Pigs invasion of Cuba, which is something that Eisenhower had signed off on in, in secret. Uh, th this is my question um, about the specific nature of these jobs that we keep hearing that are going to be supposedly created as a result of stationing F-35s here. My concern is um, how many of those jobs are going to be restricted to people that have uh, security clearances? because that's a very uh, significant factor in restricting jobs and um, restricting jobs from likely or qualified applicants or interested applicants. And it, I believe that it's a question that would help to know. So we have a more realistic idea of just how many jobs are actually going to be created for local people that want them, because I think the number is going to be very few. Thanks. Rebecca, do you want to address that one? Yeah, like I said, these jobs are not jobs for local people. They're not even jobs for the uh, Air National Guard. They're high security jobs for Lockheed Martin uh, contractors to operate the, um, the F-35 flight simulator. Lockheed Martin, this whole project is so proprietary, and this is part of the money grubbing and money sucking aspect of this project. They don't even trust the Air National Guard or the Air Force to um, to run the flight simulator because they might see the code behind it, right? So these are it's they're super restricted jobs. For, so half are for the flight simulator and half are for the Air Force Associate Active Duty, the 378 Squadron, for people who are already in the Air Force who will be relocated to come here. So none of these jobs are for anyone who lives here. I wanted to thank you for the incredible amount of work that you folks have been doing on this. And if there was like a local buzz out of these guys, you guys should be thank you. Um, also, thank you for the word boondoggle. Thank you. Um, it's actually more, more of a comment that I have. Um, I don't understand why our facts and fierce voices aren't reaching Tammy Baldwin. I don't get it. Um, I knew her years and years ago, and her focus was really on health and uh, kids' well-being, and I, this is a huge health issue, but I think we should push this out. And I wanted to make a comment, too. It was either this last October or the October before that she made very strong statements, statements about PFAS and the importance of getting those cleaned up and recognize them as a problem, and maybe that's something we can appeal to her about, is that she made that commitment in the prior years, and she should stand up to that. I cited those numbers of 1,600 firms to Lockheed Martin, 250 congressional districts in now 48 states. Tammy Baldwin, from what I, it's not just a matter of people say, well, she gets money from the uh, military industrial complex or corporations, uh, campaign contributions or lobbyists and so on. I think it's deeper than that. Uh, that is, she understands or she thinks she understands that she, 
that her bailiwick in Madison and Dane County is safe. And that she's worrying about outstate and northern Wisconsin Defense Department Navy contracts at Marinette and Manitowoc and Oconomowoc, uh, I'm sorry, Oshkosh Truck, but a whole list. Wisconsin, and it also has to do now with the fact that we're in an election year. She is not going to risk losing Wisconsin being blamed for the loss of Wisconsin by speaking out against military contracts in the state. So there's lots of variables there. Um, she doesn't talk about that. Her people don't talk about any of that. So, but it's, we have to deepen the in, an analysis and understanding of. Uh, and one final thing, it also gets to the heart of the bipartisan nature of this permanent war economy that s across history slews of progressives on every other issue come down ultimately too often on the side of we can't give up that money. So that's that's my thinking on that. Jesse. Thanks. If I could just speak to that for just a moment too. I, I would like to remind everybody there's a reason that we're not asking you to call Senator Johnson's office. <laughs> <laughs> and that for all their faults, uh, one difference between Democrats and Republicans is that Democrats are at least a little more amenable to pressure. What I can tell you is that Senator Baldwin is feeling this pressure. And if you've never written a letter to uh, any of your representatives before, if you've never made a phone call into their office before, now would be the time to do it. Uh, this is having an impact. It is having leverage. And uh, for all of the public officials at various levels, whether they be um, city level, uh, county level, uh, the governor's office, or, or even our, um, our lost uh, U.S. Senator, telling you that this is a decision for the U.S. Air Force to make, uh, they're all stakeholders. And a U.S. Senator does have a, an informal but highly respected veto over military projects in their own backyard. The military industrial complex knows uh, quite well that um, the people who vote for their military budgets are the ones who butter their bread. And if Tammy Baldwin wanted to make a public statement about this and come out against staging these jets, even though she can't stop the whole F-35 project, she is very empowered to stop them from being staged here at Truex, and she knows it. And uh, it would do you well, it's a very good investment of your time to call her office and remind them that you know it too. And you can also come on the You can also come on the 19th, a week from yesterday, right? She's gonna be at uh, Cargo East, somebody announced that? February 15th. Oh, 15th, sorry, sorry. Right, so that, that's not what I wanted to talk about, but just to segue out of that. Um, um, I think that, that uh, what's just been said is true, that if we keep building that pressure on her, she can play a role, and we should keep it up. But I wanted to say something that's going to sound maybe a little naive, but uh, it's a, a question um, that comes from, uh, you know, back in the 60s, there, was, uh, there were people writing about military-civilian conversion, conversion of military industries to civilian purposes. We don't hear anything about that anymore. But I think about it a lot. And when we hear all these prices up here, not just, and I'm not just talking about using that money for schools and everything else, I'm talking about the actual equipment about recycling military, recycling all that fancy metal that is in these planes that are already built. Research should be being done on that. It was done in the past about how you, I remember back in the time of the nuclear freeze, there was this postcard of uh, when we were trying to stop the MX missiles. It was a postcard of an MX missile. It was a little cartoon frames morphing into a snowblower. I mean, we're talking about about, uh, you know, swords into plowshares. That's what we're talking about. And if there was really uh, legitimate research going on, we have a university community here where 
somebody should be spending time looking at that. Um, and I know it sounds naive when we're building more and more weapons, but if we want to stop the permanent war economy, we've got to do something with all that equipment. So anybody know anything about that? Encourage it. I think there's one thing that's Just go ahead and start talking. I have a comment. Um, I took uh, Alan's comments to heart about uh, February 29th at Truax with a, a show of support out there at the gates. I think that's great. I just want to say that uh, next Saturday, I think everybody in this room who, if you're in town, you ought to be down there at Cargo Cafe and give Tammy a piece of your mind. Tammy Baldwin has taken, has received over $38,000 from Lockheed Martin. And, you know, I, I just think we need to let her know it's, it's just going to be a show of support for no F-35s, but I think you need to let her know. And, uh, you know, just like at Truax on the 29th, the media is going to be there, and, we you know, we need a couple hundred people out there. And I'm going to be there on the 29th, and I'm going to be there on the 19th, and I hope you are too. Thank you. Um, so I, I have a question for Maria, I think, about PFAS. Um, so there's PFAS in a lot of wells in Madison, including my well on the east side, and I'm wondering if you can speak to the connection between PFAS and wells that are not near Truax. Is there a connection to Truax, or is it just sort of like, this is being alive in America today, is there's PFAS in everyone's water, um, but is there a connection to Truax, the fact that there's PFAS in, in many wells throughout Madison? Okay, so um, what what is your well? Well, thirteen. That's up by Wheeler Road. Um, so so I've looked at all the well data, of course, all around Madison and our organization. I'll, I'll give a little hand back to us. We actually pushed for testing of all the wells for PFAS back about a year ago, and and our our water utility board agreed to direct the water utility to do that. So now we have data from all the wells. And if you look at the map of the whole, um, all of Madison, and you look at the patterns of PFAS levels found in the different wells, I don't know if any of you saw the Isthmus article that had a map with the, but the, the highest levels, of course, are, are 15, 15, but then when you look to the southeast, you see 9, you see 23, um, 11, which is by Woodman. So, so those, those, well, those PFAS numbers are not being connected by the water utility or anyone to the Truax plume. However, and I'm not a hydrogeologist, so this shouldn't, I shouldn't be quoted as an expert on this, but I will say that there are people out there who um, think that that plume is, it is, we know it's going to the southeast. We also know that plumes do go miles and miles. In Minnesota, the, the, the 3M plumes have gone, they cover, they cover like 130, 150 square miles. So it is not too unreasonable to think that that, that, that um, plume of PFAS is going to the southeast and has affected those other wells. Now, I, again, I'm not speaking as an expert here, but I know other people have speculated that. There are other sources of, of PFAS, okay? There's landfills, um, there's uh, bio sludge, you know, sewage sludge spreading, and that's mostly going on the outskirts, on in the outskirts of Madison. Um, there are any number of other potential sources, and one of the reasons we pushed to test all the wells is because of well 15. We knew that was, you know, obviously connected to the Truex um, plume. But we also wanted to know what, what are some other sources. I mean, this is a way to kind of gauge, you know, where the sources are. But it's a really good question. And Well 13, which is my well as well, is up on Wheeler Road. And they, we learned, I was, where's that PFAS coming from? It isn't a super high level, but it's high enough that, you know, I'd be concerned, especially if I was pregnant or something, that there's an old landfill there. And old landfills are a big source of um, of PFAS, or can be a source of PFAS. Now, there's a couple other things. Truex, and this is where, Truex Field, it's not just the base. You have to understand that there's a Truex landfill right next to Ale Asylum. 
The military used that landfill for a long time for all sorts of things. Uh, some stories I've heard about what's in that landfill are not pretty. Um, a lot of solvents, a lot of chemicals. Also, um, I've heard speculation of radioactive nuclear materials. They put a lot of stuff there. And just south of that is the old Burke sewage treatment plant, which is right behind Pick and Save. They um, did sewage treatment for the city, the county. Oscar Mayer used it. The military took it over during World War II and um, used it for sewage treatment. That also, we know there's PFAS there. They actually, we actually have groundwater PFAS data from there. So, it, it, but that's all, that all whole area is connected and the military used all of it, the landfill work sewage. So, and how far those plumes of PFAS have gone is anyone's guess. This is one reason why it's so critical that we get some resources to know, you know, where it's gone. I mean, we know it's gone into Stark Little Creek and all the way down, but how far has it gone underwater and, and things like that. So, I don't know, <laughs> sort of a messy answer, but. <laughs> Hi, uh, Kevin Cunningham, District 26. Uh, so you've talked about putting pressure on Tammy Baldwin to get her to slow this project down. Is there anything that can be done at the city or county level to slow down or help at least temporarily put a stop to the F-35 from coming in, like withholding permits or anything like that? Thanks. That's a good question. Um, and. I I was just thinking, like, we had 15 supervisors um, sign a letter um, during the public comment period of the EIS to oppose the um, sighting of the F-35s. There were four that submitted a letter um, in support of the F-35s, and then about half that just didn't say anything. Um, and that's essentially what the county executive has done. He has said that it's not our decision. Um, I think he's expressed some concerns in private meetings, but it really has not come out on this. Um, and so we're, we've got a county board that is kind of um, either mostly neutral or against it, um, but we're also in the middle of a leadership transition. And we have a brand new county board chair and um, a new second vice chair and a bunch of people that are campaigning and about to get elected um, unopposed and I'm not sure what they've said about F-35s. I have asked for um, legal opinions about what our leverage is um, as the landowner. We have a joint use agreement um, with the Air National Guard that will be up for renewal this year and I think there is some um, question about, you know, can we um, require them to clean up um, the PFAS uh, before any work um, gets started on this project to meet one of the demands of the coalition. And I, I absolutely think that's something we need to, to look into and consider and do if we can. I think we need to look at what we need to do to protect um, ourselves from becoming a target because we're part of a, you know, nuclear um, mission. Um, so, yes, Dane County is not only a, you know, responsible party, um, as well as the City of Madison and the Air National Guard for PFAS, and I think that's, you know, the, the big hook we have right now is that the DNR has said you gotta, you gotta clean this up, and yet, you know, they're still planning to start construction in April. Um, that's unacceptable, and that's exactly what we need um, County Executive Parisi to be speaking out against. Um, and demanding that this cleanup take place before anything starts. We need, um, you know, the, the city and um, the Air National Guard obviously needs to, to take responsibility and the, and, and the county. At the end of the day, this is our land that the airport is on. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of players in this, and that, Rebecca, if you want to speak to, you know, from a city standpoint, uh, my understanding is that, you know, the, the land use process is still going through the city um, uh, planning commission. Um, Marsha's on the planning commission and she's here. But I think, you know, th the city still has um, its powers. The military is not exempt from that, um, as far as I know. Um, so there will be decision points coming up in the next year, and I think it's really important that we get some of these folks who have failed to say anything to really um, come out and, and, and voice um, their opinion on this issue. 
And you know, it is a county board election year, so it's a really good time to be asking people what their position is and what they're gonna do um, with these threats that we face. Marsha, did you have a question? Oh. I did, I was waiting to see if Rebecca was gonna okay. chime in. But thank you, um, everybody, for all your work. Um, it's, and it's great to see the people coming out again. I, my question is, when we showed the slide about the where we're at, or like at the end of the month, we'll hear something from the, the Air Force, and then there's a 30-day period. My question is, what opportunities are there in that 30-day period to do anything, or is it just a clock starts, and then it stops, and then they move forward? And then um, following up on the PFAS, it seems to me the DNR has the, is a gatekeeper, uh, assuming the Air Force follows our state law, um, and they sh could be pressured to to make sure that you know the, the remediation plan for the whole site, not just for a building they want to tear down and build something new on. So I think that on that level we need to pressure the the, the governor and our our assembly and senators. And there's also an assembly and senate election coming up, and I know they're going to be candidates running for Melissa Sargent's seat, and I believe who's seeking the state Senate seat, and I believe we need to ask all candidates what they think about F-35s and, and get them on the record. But my question is what, in the immediate period, great, going to February 29th is great, but what else can we do? So what's gonna happen at the end of February um, is that they're going to issue the final EIS, and that's what that 30-day waiting period is um, the time between when they, they make public the final EIS, which supposedly will have dealt with all 6,000 plus of the comments and questions that they received from all of us, and the time with which they're gonna make an actual basing decision. So, and, and as um, you know, Marcia, because you were in this meeting, the, the Assistant Secretary of the Air Force came to Madison in November, and several of us elected met with him, he's the number two guy at the Air Force in charge of basing decisions, basically. He's in charge of installments, environment, and energy. And what he opened up with was telling us that, um, you know, he was really proud of the 115th fighter wing, how much community support they had, and this community has al al always supported them, and, um, you know, he really notices the difference between Madison and other communities where commanders are dealing with lawsuits and direct actions and demonstrations and that, um, you know, that's not a situation they want to get into in Madison. And so we were able to tell him, well, that's a situation you're about to get in, that you're in right now because of this is you're facing, the, the lawsuits are already being prepared, the direct actions are already happening. And he said, well, he said, the reason why I'm here is because we, we started seeing press reports about the city of Madison taking this resolution against the F-35s. The county board, the school board, all of these organized government entities making public statements against this. And so I say this and I share this with you to let you know that that factors into their decision-making process. So when that final EIS comes out, we have, we, there's actually sort of a, a team of, a, of several of us who have committed to just plowing through that and reading it and taking sections and, and getting through it as fast as we can and then communicating with the community and with the people who are doing the lawsuits and getting out a public message um, that yet we still oppose this and, and this is why. So those 30 days are gonna be critical for um, public pressure and that 29th is going to be, they, I think they said they're gonna release it the 27th or the end of that week. So that's going to be a really important time to keep up the public um, pressure. And I just, on, on the PFAS issue, um, it's my understanding, correct me if I'm wrong, Maria, but the DNR has not ordered them to clean up the mess. The DNR has simply ordered them a year and a half ago to do a complete site investigation, to just figure out where that plume is. And they're, they're even in violation of that. So that's the order that the DNR is trying to enforce 
to get the Air Force to just study the problem and get good information out. We're, I don't think, we're not even at the point where the well, DNA. So let me get. You can't thoroughly investigate the, the extent of the contamination before you even know, you know, where to start and to, to, to remediate. Um, no, no. They, like I said, um, and I would have gone into this more if I had more time, but um, they, they discovered the PFAS there, they tested it in, in 2017, and then, you know, if they were following NR 700 laws, DNR laws, or these are the skills laws, then they would, they would be, you know, there's a timeline for cleaning up, you know, 30, 60, 90 days, there's a whole timeline. Well, they just, the military just said, you know, blow that off. The, the DNR did, I'm skipping over a lot of details, but they did, they did um, give them a notice of violation right around the end of November, I think it was. October, okay, yeah, it was right around, yeah. And, and um, but that's, notice is a violation, I and mean, it's a good step, but it was a little late in coming, in and, and it's like, well, what does that mean? I've seen lots of entities get notices of violation and just continue to blow it up. So, um, I guess, you know, what, the thing that concerns me now, and some people in the audience, I think I'm looking at Lance, who's talking, but um, that, that we, 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 our understanding right now is that the DNR is looking at the construction that's coming up in, in, a, in a month or a couple months as a way to get the, get the Air National Guard to kind of test a little here, test a little there, maybe clean up a little here and a little there. And so they're not saying, you know, you can't do it, it's just not okay. They're saying, okay, well, we'll take what we can get from you and allow you to start building and get a little, you know, bit of information here. And to, to me and to those who understand, you know, what you need to know to really um, clean up and, and really know the extent of what's going on here, that's not sufficient. The law says, you know, investigate the, the full extent, you know, laterally and vertically of the plume. And they're not going to do that. It sounds like they're going to kind of just allow them to go forward piecemeal. And so I, you know, that concerns me actually. That that that's the approach they're taking. And I will say, and I can't. It's too detailed. It, and it's complicated, and I have yet to understand all the ways that the county and the city. There are things they can do. When I hear there's nothing we can do, it's only DNR. I, I push back on that. I, there are things they can do um, given their stormwater and construction laws and, and, and zone. There are all sorts of things. It's just, I, I think everyone's deferring to the DNR. They do have a lot of power, but it doesn't make the city and county helpless, especially when the county owns most of that land. There, there are lots of meetings coming up, by the way. Um, lakes and watershed. There are all kinds of meetings. Ener, uh, they're coming up. Airport Commission. Any number of these meetings are great places for people to go and say, hey, you have responsibilities here um, in making sure this construction does not happen until it's cleaned up. So um, that was a good question, and I think we're going to need to close down because we have to clean up. Oh, we can get a couple more questions. But just also in response to that, if you open up um, your program on the inside, there's like, all these things you can do, and one of them is to write an editorial to the newspaper, and we have a rotating editorial schedule so we can continue to have things in the paper so that we don't end up having weeks when this is not in the public eye. So um, Brad's email address is in there, and if you email him, he'll let you know when your time is, comes. Two more questions. Two more questions. Yeah. Hello. Hello. Yeah. Uh, just a couple. Just a couple bits of information. Uh, one about about the PFAS. Yesterday, I learned uh, the people from the DNR. They, you know, they tested the fish in Starkweather, Monona. They're going to test the fish in the other down in all the lakes this summer. And since this has been putting out into the water, and it's all through Lake Monona at kind of the same level, it's probably all through the other lakes below that too. So they're probably going to find that all the fish in all the lakes, maybe not Mendota are concluded. This is going to be another big one because we, uh, if people say, oh, you can't eat the fish in the lakes and they're all polluted, that's going to be a big thing uh, to help push this along. Um, secondly, uh, uh, Christy from the mayor's office told me yesterday that she met with the Air National Guard and the Dane County and the DNR last week and they were assuring 
that uh, things are moving forward to do more testing, and they are starting to find out how the pollution is getting into the creek. And you know, so I'm kind of hopeful about that. Um, I do want to add a couple questions. One is uh, the what I call the aggravation easements. Uh, those are aggravation <laughs> easements. Um, can people turn that around and say, I don't want that anymore? Does it have to always go to the next owner? And uh, do they have to give the 2000 back? Who paid that 2000 in the first place? And do people buy properties without even knowing about that? Those are my questions about that. And I also want to know about uh, the when and where details on the 29th. When should people come and where should they be to, to do the big march on the, on the airport? Thanks. Those are uh, great questions. Uh, so let me go chronologically. Uh, the folks who were paid that $2,000 or what it may have varied, but most of the, the easements that we have pulled, by the way. And just a note about that. Um, these documents are held at the Dane County uh, Record of Deeds, and uh, they are not available online. They're hard to find. Uh, members of our staff spent over 40 hours poring over these records because um, they're not something that you can find with a street address. They're not something you can find with a tax parcel number. We had to uh, translate all of these into the legal description. So if you've ever had a survey done that is, you know, uh, the Southwest Plat of uh, Jim Rockefeller development back from 2000 or 1920, whatever. Uh, so, you know, the Southwestern corner of that. So then you have to use this very uh, uh, convoluted legal description of the piece of property to find those easements. Um, yes, they run with the land, so if the homeowner from 1994 uh, sold off this easement to the airport, um, that is tied indelibly with that deed uh, in perpetuity, unless, unless one party were to, you know, were, unless those parties were agreed upon to release that deed, which doesn't sound, in, in our discussions, doesn't sound like it's something that um, Dane County is willing or possibly even able to do, but we're not sure about that because I'm not a lawyer. However, um, you cannot, as a homeowner, just say, uh, takes these backsies, I don't, I don't want any part of this anymore. And in fact, many homeowners don't know they have them. Uh, we have experienced uh, um, one folks that, that actually one of our employees who recently bought a home in the Eakin Park neighborhood didn't realize she had one of these easements. We did find it in her title work, usually like a driveway easement. It's right there, page one or two or three, very close to the top, very easy to read. This was buried all the way in the bottom uh, and doesn't always explain exactly what it is or the implications of it, certainly. No one brought that up to her. I mean, obviously, if you've ever closed on a home before, you sign a whole lot. Of, most of your hour is spent just signing your signature over and over and over again. And most of that you had days to go over with separately with uh, your mortgage lender, so they can go over um, all the T's and I's with you, you know, your, your realtor, the title company, they make all this stuff available and, and a lot of this stuff gets sprung at the last minute. Who paid the money? Who paid the money? That would be Dane County. Either the, the airport or uh, Dane County itself, I'm not sure which of those entities, uh, but they're very tied together as the county owns the airport. Oh, no, no, the, the military did not pay for those easements, and um, my understanding is FAA requirements preclude and halt the, the military as a tenant of the airport from engaging any, any kind of direct compensation. So, you know, when we talk about 65 um, DNL being where the federal government starts to say, hey, these folks are something that we're going to start hearing about, and we should start um, saying, if we were to have a program, uh, eventually, these are the folks that would get it. Above 75 DNL is typically not eligible anymore for those because that is considered where they start bulldozing. And FAA requirements decide that uh, the owner of the airport is the one who must purchase those properties to be condemned. So uh, when folks in Sun Prairie or Verona think, gosh, the airport's really far from me, that sounds like somebody else's problem. As county taxpayers, they're very much alone. Um, that, that money for those easements came as part of a prior uh, Part 150 program through the FAA. So for future, so whatever future Part 150 program happens, they are going to push hard for anyone who receives any assistance to sign new easements if they, if they don't already have them. That's what we learned in Burlington. 
In regard to the logistics for February 29th, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> um, we'll be gathering at the intersection of Wright and Anderson on the, what is that, the southeast corner of Wright and Anderson. There's an open space kitty corner across from the MATC um, Madison College campus at Anderson. Um, and we will be going north on Wright Street to, what is that name of that street? No. Well, for, no, no. We're going to be going north on Wright Street to about three, four blocks. Thank you, cab driver. Uh, uh, to Piersdorf, which is about three or four blocks up. And turn left and halfway into that block is the main gate for, for Truex. So that's basically the parade route. There'll be other logistics and other information on that as, as we can GL stuff, but uh, that's the approximate scenario with this plate. Oh, sorry, noon. And I would say if you haven't yet, please go to the website, especially because there's been a lot of work that's been revamping it and fine tuning it and um, signed up there, be, get on the petition. That way we can give you updates as we approach this or if we have any other kind of snap action um, that requires a rapid response, then you'd be on that list. Hello. Can I go? <laughs> okay. um, I'm thinking of going to the airport commissioner's meeting again this uh, Wednesday and I was just curious if most of the people that are on the airport commissioners, whatever board, are they also in politics? Are they trying to, I think I heard that there are um, uh, politicians in Sun Prairie and trying to get money there. So I was just curious if I was up against kind of like a double whenever you know we ask questions. And then um, two, this is kind of just like a larger question, but um, why is there no like government oversight on the way that they're developing these products? Like, um, so the past couple of months, like we've looked at um, here in Madison, the police lobby and getting more government oversight on that whole process. And so with them, it just seems like with the military, um, I had a government contractor uh, for a roommate when I lived in Colorado and he was a level four security clearance, um, worked on uh, remote missile defense and he was an alcoholic. I know this sounds like an AA meeting. I don't mean it to sound like that. But um, he, there was really no oversight. It was just 20 year olds kind of telling other 20 year olds what to do and um, come out with this stuff. So it's it's kind of like, I, you know, it's like I see the Note 35 and then the Boeing, you know, 737 or whatever come out and it's just, it feels like it's gonna keep happening with these government contractors. Like it's just sort of a cyclical thing because there's no oversight on the product. And um, you know, I can go on Amazon and like order mm -hmm. a blender, you know, and read like 300 different reviews of like people, you know, debating about that. And it just, it feels like as like, you know, a consumer in that kind of approach, it just feels like we're getting, you know, just okay. the bad end of the deal. So I, I'm wondering like, you know, I, we're playing defense right now, like dealing with the defense, but like when will they start setting these kind of guidelines in the future is what I'm curious about. So thanks. Um, thanks for the question. I can, I'll quickly address the airport commission question to an extent. There are four county supervisors on that commission, um, only one of which has openly opposed the F-35s and, and expressed concern about PFAS, that's Supervisor Russ, who represents an adjacent district. Um, but there are other supervisors, Steve Peters, uh, Marine McCarville, um, and Jerry Bollig, oh, there's maybe five, and, and Andy Shower, who, you know, need to feel your pressure on this. Um, and then, you know, there's a, just a few other community members on the commission. I don't know, Maria, did you want to give more insight? By and large, the commission has not been very responsive to the concerns, from my understanding, when people have attended the airport commission. Um, yeah, I don't want to throw a wet blanket on anyone's enthusiasm to go to the airport commission, but our experience is there, um, despite the fact that one supervisor is now, you know, more supportive. Um, 
and we've mostly gone there. We've mostly gone there on the F30, well, the PFAS, but you know these issues are connected. So both F35 and PFAS people have gone there, and unfortunately, it's been a little tense, more than a little tense. And I know just to, just to prepare people, I say still go, but be prepared for the airport commission alerts the um, people at Air National Guard to come there when they know people are coming, and it and and so there'll be a colonel or someone in the room. And the last time we went, it was very much, um, you know, there's a colonel sitting there and we're being told not to talk to him. So there's a lot of, um, you know, I mean, the reality is, correct me if I'm wrong, Heidi, maybe you know, or someone else, the airport and the Air National Guard have been, you know, working together for decades. And they know each other and they, they're about helping each other and, you know, supporting each other. So it's not really surprising. But yet, it's a little concerning when you go to an airport commission and you're told things like, you know, don't dare direct any comments to Colonel Philpott sitting behind you or whatever because they know you're coming. And so just, you know, that's just the reality of the politics of this. So that's just my real world experience. Yeah. Um, we have nine minutes or we're going to start getting charged more. So we really do have to wrap up. Um, there is one question down here, we're going to get to that. I think your other question is a longer answer about corruption in our political system that we don't have time to get into, unfortunately. Um, but one last question here, and then we're going to um, get ourselves out of the building. Okay. I don't know if the yes, decibels are up. Anyway, um, I know I had, uh, in the first commentary period, that uh, uh, I had, you know, they asked for opinions, and I said, yeah, let's dump them off on Detroit or Boise. Uh, of the five that they that they were contemplating uh, what, where to put them, and I, then all of a sudden it was like, yeah, you know, uh, our government, the Senate, they just passed it through, got out of the way, and uh, I, I I heard afterward, and I, I know I sent a link to you, Alan, and also to uh, Representative Taylor, uh, and I found out after the fact that Selfridge, uh, the Detroit uh, Air National uh, Base is begging for the F-35. Take them. What, does anybody know about that? What, I mean, I, I mean where, where are we going? And, and we do need support from the mayor, from the governor, which is pretty irreproachable. I have a friend that, uh, Patty Randolph, ever heard of her, animal rights activist. No time of day does the governor have for her. So we can't go that route. But I, I, I certainly would believe, and you know, I was for Bernie Birdman, Sanders, he's for the F-35. And I found that out like last week. So, I don't know, I, I, no, that, that's all I'm gonna pull. So I was gonna go into more, but I know we don't have time. Thank you. Okay, um, I think that's it. If you still have questions, please put them in the basket or give them to an organizer and we'll try to um, follow up with you via email um, to your questions. Thanks so much for coming.